You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon from Washington, D.C. My name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East West Center and Director of the East West Center in Washington program. Absolutely delighted today to have with us for our Indo-Pacific Democratic Values and Human Rights series, uh, um, a professor from the University of Toronto, uh, a place just a little north of us here and uh, probably even a bit colder than it is in Washington today, but delighted to have Professor Jacques Bertrand, uh, whose new uh, book is Democracy and Nationalism in Southeast Asia from Secessionist Mobilization to Conflict Resolution. And as you will note from the biography that you received in the context of the invitation, that he has a number of books on Southeast Asia and issues related to ethnic integration, secession, um, nationalism, et cetera. Um, and so he's a real scholar of Southeast Asia. He is a professor and associate chair of the graduate program and political science at the University of Toronto. And he also heads the School of Collaborative Masters uh, program at the Contemporary East and Southeast Asian Studies program at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Affairs. So he really comes at this um, from a political science background, from a specialization in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, and we're delighted to have him. As many of you know, uh, here at least in um, the Washington policy arena, we've been discussing a lot about the democratic future of Southeast Asia, the democratic deficit decline of Southeast Asia, uh, and those kinds of issues. But what I thought was particularly compelling and interesting about Professor Bertrand's work is that he looks at democracy, but also its relationship to key ongoing nation and state building projects in Southeast Asia. And so I thought that would be great to get an update on, on the implications of democracy. Welcome, Dr. Bertrand. I know you have a um, PowerPoint that you will go through that will last approximately 45 minutes, and then we'll have sufficient time for Q&A from our colleagues who have joined us. As you know, some people are watching live stream on YouTube, so we won't see them here, but there are also an additional set of people uh, on YouTube, and we'll get those questions uh, through the chat uh, in due course. But welcome. Thank you for doing, taking the time to do this, and the floor is yours, sir. Great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, uh, Satu, and thank you so much for the very kind introduction and, and invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to come and and discuss on what is a relatively mild day, surprisingly, in Toronto. We just had minus 24 yesterday. So yes, it is a bit colder in Toronto these days. Um, so I, I will simply switch to my PowerPoint presentation to um, essentially uh, proceed with explaining and discussing uh, what um, I advertise as, is democracy still relevant to reduce secessionist conflict? in the region. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is the puzzle of secessionist conflict. And um, as the title of my uh, book that was published a few months ago from Cambridge University Press suggests, um, I see secessionist, when I say secessionist conflict, I'm uh, equating it as well with nationalist conflicts, uh, regionally based nationalist conflicts. So the book is really uh, talking about uh, why there continues to be secessionist conflict and more precis precisely uh, in the context of Southeast Asia, what is the relationship with uh, democracy? To what extent does democracy help or hinder uh, nationalist conflict in the region? And in some ways the reflection is also more uh, broadly comparative. If we think about uh, nationalist conflict in Asia much more broadly, I mean, one of the things that struck me and, and some of the other work that I've done has, has sort of been thinking about this uh, in, in broader historical terms. It is striking that the region has uh, a fair number, uh, a large number of what we could understand to be as nationalist conflicts. Uh, reaching from uh, the Uyghurs and Tibetans in China to uh, the cases that I'm looking at today uh, or in this book, which are the Moros, Papuans, Malay Muslims in Thailand, 
the uh, Achenese, Indonesia, Kashmiris in India are not part of the book, but they're another example. And of course, a number of, uh, of these groups in Myanmar, which I uh, look at very, very briefly in this book, but mostly uh, is the emphasis of my uh, forthcoming book uh, that'll be coming out uh, in the spring. So um, the nationalist conflicts in Asia uh, are persistent. Uh, they're characterized most of the time by violent conflict. And of course, in many cases, as elsewhere, they occur in both democratic and authoritarian settings. So the key questions for me in this book uh, were to, to think about, does democracy tend to reduce or exacerbate nationalist conflict? And I came to this question is, has been ongoing for a couple of several decades or a couple of decades at least. Uh, ever since uh, there was a lot of flurry of, of, of work that was done uh, in the 1990s, 2000s, in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, and a lot of uh, wave, democratic wave across various regions of the world. And the, one of the questions was, does it tend to uh, increase nationalist conflict? And there was a big debate at the time about the fact that uh, it did tend to sometimes uh, increase violent conflict. Elections were sometimes volatile moments. Uh, and uh, I think the debate in the end was never uh, particularly resolved. To me, it was useful to think about this in the context of Southeast Asia, in part because of what uh, Satu was mentioning, which Southeast Asia has struggled with having uh, relatively less uh, democracy or more uh, unstable democracy. Uh, nevertheless, there have been democratic moments, uh, significant ones, since some countries continue to be pretty strongly uh, democratic in comparative terms. And it's useful, I think, to think historically as to where, um, what impact this has had on nationalist conflict. The second question that really drives this study is, is to explain the variance in the conflict outcomes. Uh, why do we see sometimes conflict um, uh, become more larger scale and at other times tends to uh, seem to be resolved. Uh, and this is an important point for me uh, because the absence of, conf uh, of violence to me doesn't necessarily mean absence of conflict. And that's something I think that is useful uh, and important to think about when we look at the region. The argument I make in the book uh, is, uh, the first part of the argument is relatively straightforward. And that is that uh, on the basis of the Southeast Asian cases that I've looked at, uh, I think there's a convincing case to be made that democracy does indeed reduce violent outcomes. Uh, the, the trajectory that we see, uh, generally speaking, is that there are some mechanisms at work when you have democratic periods that do tend to dampen uh, violence. And, and when I say violence, I mean both from the state and from uh, the uh, armed groups or nationalist groups themselves. But there are two caveats, and they're quite important, I think. The first is that what we do see in many cases is that in the short term, uh, there's a fair amount of uncertainty that sets in. And, and, and that is, is, I think, consistent with what uh, was done in, in work based on other regions, where there's a period of transition where uncertainty becomes a moment where uh, we do see spikes in violence that occur. But part of the argument I made in, make in the book is that we shouldn't read too much into those short-term spikes in violence because oftentimes the democratic process when it persists and continues tends to then uh, lead to lowering of, of these uh, violent outcomes uh, over time. Um, and also, violence subsides, however, and this is the sort of the uh, flip side of this argument, is that uh, in many cases, though, conflict often remains deep. Uh, and so, yes, less violence, but it doesn't mean that democracy is actually has a good record at resolving these nationalist conflicts. And that's, I think, a, an area that uh, really does require that we reflect a little more deeply about the, the implications. The book uh, deals with uh, five Southeast Asian cases. Uh, the groups have similar structures and initial traje trajectories, which was why I chose to, uh, to, to look at these. I have the Achenese, Papuans, Moros, Cordilleras, which we haven't heard about in many in a long time, Malay Muslims in Thailand. Um, the characteristics of these groups, not dissimilar from other places in the world and in the region. Uh, they were all uh, less than 4% of the population. Uh, territorially concentrated, and all their starting point that I look at analytically 
are that under authoritarian rule, you had very significant uh, episodes of violent mobilization. So the starting point is, if these cases and if these groups all had violent mobilization under authoritarian rule, what happens when you open up, uh, become more liberalized, and have democratic a period of democ democracy that sets in? Um, I'm going to be emphasizing today, just for purposes of time, I'll be looking at the cases of the Moros uh, and uh, in the Philippines and uh, the Malay Muslims in Thailand. Happy in the Q&A to uh, elaborate more on uh, Achenese Papuans or Cordillerans, uh, depending on uh, the interest uh, that you might have. So nationalist violence, and I want to emphasize this, is different from other ethnic conflict. Oftentimes they get sort of uh, amalgamated as if they're one phenomenon. And I think what's really important here uh, is that nationalist violence has a particular, or secession, which secessionism is oftentimes the main uh, political objective of it. Nationalist violence is different because it strikes at the core of state sovereignty. Not all ethnic conflicts do so, these ones do. Uh, and that means that there's something uh, that is uh, deeper and much more difficult to resolve in any regime type because of this um, core uh, principle of state sovereignty that, it, uh, that nationalist conflict uh, tends to, um, to, to, uh, to strike at. The second, uh, or you know, the consequence is that the gap therefore is wide between these respective objectives and uh, nationalist groups in the state have, have a very difficult uh, and wide gap uh, to, uh, to fill in order to reach a negotiated settlement. So nevertheless, I think that uh, there are better chances that this gap can be uh, reduced when we do have democratic processes at work and the book uh, comparatively looks at the region and draws a few uh, reasons why this is the case. The first is that it increases channels for mobilization, that, no, it, it, that it opens up the possibilities, not only that uh, uh, violent mobilization being uh, one uh, option that remains, of course, but it does mean that there are channels that can be used inside and outside of the formal process, whether it's demonstrations, protests uh, that are peaceful, or uh, an attempt to access through a variety of ways the political process uh, through formation of political parties or trying to gain representation in parliament or in some cases gaining cabinet representation or other uh, forms of representation. It also dilutes the claims to national group representation, which is really important. Uh, little less so in some of the cases I'll be talking to today, very much so in Myanmar and in many other cases, is that one of the significant elements of democracy is that it removes the ability of armed groups to be the sole representatives of, uh, of a nationalist group. Um, and, and democracy therefore dilutes the representation by allowing alternative forms of representation that choose uh, peaceful mo modes of mobilization as opposed to uh, uh, armed mobilization. Uh, it increases the cost of violence over time. It, this might be an obvious for the state, although in the cases that I'm looking at, uh, in some cases, one might uh, wonder uh, to what extent it does, but, but the, the, the point is that democracy increases the cost of violence over time because politically it's very difficult for a democratic uh, state to continue to uh, repress, use large scale violence against a segment of a population without at some level raising some criticisms about its democratic credentials. So through that, simply even that reputational part, uh, it does play a significant uh, significant uh, aspect. And something very similar happens with, uh, with uh, uh, the nationalist groups themselves, that the idea that democracy should be a space that is more open to alternative, more peaceful ways of, uh, of uh, approaching a conflict with the state. Obviously, civilian populations suffer tremendously during violent conflicts. And so there's a, 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 an incentive for uh, nationalist groups as well to find alternative paths to uh, violence. Um, in the book, I, I have a, an overview uh, of um, what I see as a, uh, a process of uh, democratization that has two stages and that we can trace in a number of uh, different cases. 
and have their own sort of logic on how they uh, impact uh, basically the, um, the uh, violent outcomes. In the initial stages, uh, when, when uh, countries first start democratizing, uh, there is a really uh, uh, an important moment where uncertainty is, is very high. Uh, and that creates a dynamic in which it's, there's a high risk and a high probability that violent outcomes can occur uh, in that time period because nationalist groups are trying to negotiate a new deal. They're trying to see opportunities and the state is on, and it's unclear what direction the state's going to take relative to their cause. So uh, that is where the, the risk of violence rises pretty dramatically. But on the other hand, it opens up opportunity for negotiation. And, and, and we see this in the Philippines, we see it in Indonesia, uh, not the case in Thailand, where there is that moment where there is a hope that with a democratic regime, negotiation and true negotiation can occur. These are important sort of two sides of, this, uh, of a coin. With the uncertainty on the rise, it's important and oftentimes key the timing at which the state signals that it's ready to negotiate or to change the terms uh, of their uh, arrangement uh, in the polity towards the nationalist groups. So it sets the term for the terrain uh, for the state to signal compromise. And that becomes a very key important uh, time uh, initially. At the later stages, uh, which I call the democratic stability, it's a, it's a trickier period. At that point, a new constitution oftentimes is in place. Democratic institutions are set up with a particular structure, particular nature of representation of groups. And so the terms in which the groups um, can be represented or negotiate new, uh, their status really becomes uh, a lot more um, uh, fixed, uh, and it alters then, therefore, the, the parameters of group mobilization. When, you know, under what conditions can they mobilize? Can they mobilize within institutions? Uh, do they, if they, whether there are alternatives outside of institutions and so forth? So that's a little bit sort of the, the framework that I adopt to sort of uh, make the case that on the basis of what uh, I was looking at in Southeast Asia, there are uh, important dynamics of the democratic process that can allow for a reduction of violent conflict. Um, but there's still variance and the variance in outcomes really go from continued violence to of course negotiated agreements. So when we look at Aceh, uh, the first the free Aceh movement having reached a very high level of um, uh, of agreement with the with the the state on institutionalized law new government to the Moros most recently uh, and then uh, Papuans uh, uh, Malay Muslims being uh, less favorable in 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 as an outcome Cordillerans are a different case that I'm happy to talk about as well the the outcomes are really they vary uh, in part uh, because of the factors I want to outline here and. Um, these factors are not uh, all, um, ex ex don't explain everything. Uh, there are unique uh, factors in each case, but uh, they are interesting to sort of trace across the cases. One is of course uh, a structural one, which is a difference in mobilizational capacity that becomes uh, an important differentiating point. Um, the second, and this links to what I said about the initial stages, is state concessions and transitional stages. Those states that put uh, that had concessions very quickly when they started to uh, democratize tended to be able to delay uh, or even prevent a rise in violence uh, after the uh, democratization started. And this uh, I'll go through a little bit more specifically in the case of Philippines. Electoral coalitions are tricky, but very important uh, in the democratic context. Uh, oftentimes, that when we see electoral coalitions that are supportive of concessions, uh, there's been a, a better chance, of course, that, uh, that uh, more peaceful outcomes were going to occur, negotiations were going to advance. Um, this is tricky because, of course, there is the, side, the other side to it where electoral coalitions supportive of repressive strategies have also been one of the reasons why you've had continued violence in some places, and I'll get to that in the case of Thailand. Um, Interesting point uh, when comparing the Philippines to other cases, presidential systems uh, with independent parliaments uh, are more challenging. 
Uh, and when I mean by independent parliaments, I mean the separation of powers, strict separation of power between the executive and the legislature, as you have in the Philippines. Uh, and this becomes trickier because it's typically the executive that negotiates, neg uh, negotiates with our armed groups and with uh, nationalist groups, but it's parliaments that ratify laws that come out of them and parliaments have their own political interests. And so it becomes sometimes very challenging to reconcile uh, the two. Perhaps one of the most important points, something that's been done, uh, uh, the credibility of commitments has been a, a, a very strong um, factor in, in the literature that talks about violent conflict. But I make the case here that democracy is a substitute for what we oftentimes see as credible commitment, but it has uh, some conditions to it. The credibility of commitments is usually associated with uh, when you have uh, an external party that comes and monitors a peace agreement that intervene, a, a, a third party intervener. In the cases of Southeast Asia, these were rare, uh, if at all, uh, present. And the role they played were, were relatively small in Aceh and uh, in, in the Philippines, in the South. So um, in some cases, what I, when I uh, make the claim is that democracy here, what helps to uh, make institutions more uh, predictable, uh, they introduce accountability, and it's through that process, particularly when uh, elements are constitutionalized, that you, the commitments become uh, more uh, credible. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is how um, I uh, introduce in the book the way in which these cases inform uh, my reflection about how democracy has interacted with uh, nationalist conflicts. And, for purposes of time, I've chosen to contrast two cases that are quite opposite to each other, certainly in their outcomes. Uh, the Moros having most recently uh, obtained recognition as Banksamoro and having obtained a new law and a new uh, Bang uh, Banksamoro transitional authority and that uh, is um, uh, just newly uh, being, being established with at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the Malay Muslims who continue today, of course, to have very little gains. Um, and, and, and of course, Thailand is not democratic today, um, but um, I'm looking more specifically at uh, what happened during the democratic periods uh, in uh, contrasting the two cases. So let me start uh, perhaps uh, with, the, with the Moros uh, and, oops, I'm getting it. So the starting point, as I said, um, at no different from all the other cases where you have a period in the 70s where you have the formation of uh, the MNLF, uh, a split in 1984 between the Moro National Liberation Front and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. They become two major organizations opposing the state under authoritarian regime. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, these were periods of high uh, violent oppositions. Um, very different, of course, from other cases where you do uh, get two organizations that are competing for representation of the group, uh, which has its own uh, dynamics as well. Key here, uh, when we think about uh, the uh, democratization uh, in 1986, uh, is that uh, we see an initial period uh, that leads to a brief uh, lull uh, in violence. And this was key. Uh, concessions were made uh, and uh, they, uh, they, they were quite important initially, uh, but I want to make the case that uh, afterwards part of the problem was that they became uh, somewhat diluted. So if we think, for instance, about in 1986, uh, uh, Korea Kino had begun to make promises very quickly to negotiate autonomy uh, for the Moros, met with Nur Misrari, uh, permitted the MNLF to hold large, a large Congress in 1986 uh, and certainly signaled that with uh, the democratization, uh, the government was going to uh, be ready to negotiate autonomy with the MNLF. The MNLF at the time was quite openly claiming all of Mindanao uh, and, and talking about uh, negotiations at the very least on the basis of what had been an agreement with the Marcos regime uh, for the establishment of autonomy in 13 provinces in Mindanao, Basilan, and, Su and the Sulu archipelago. The MNLF was asking for even more at the time. However, the, the sort of basis uh, 
was this Tripoli agreement that Marcos never implemented, never intended to implement, but that had became basically the, the negotiating basis for, uh, for the, the, the Moros to, um, to continue to make claims to a very large portion of uh, Mindanao uh, in uh, the south of the Philippines. Uh, now, that Aquino uh, was ready to make those kinds of um, uh, concessions was important um, the Congress, uh, the Constitutional Commission was an important step as well that uh, constitutionalized autonomy uh, for uh, the Moros. And I think that is a very important step. However, uh, and here goes the, 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 the independent process from the president, what was being constitutionalized was autonomy for Muslim Mindanao, whereas the 13 provinces in Mindanao included a fair amount of regions, uh, provinces that were majority Christian, for instance. Um, so that immediately opened up uh, a, a, uh, a further uh, problem between the MNLF and the and, and, the, and Aquino um, or the, the Philippine uh, state, in that um, the, uh, the the Constitutional Commission had basically reduced to a, a much smaller region uh, what was going to be constitutionalized as autonomy uh, for uh, for the Moros. Um, so legislation and, and, and a subsequent referendum that occurred created uh, a, an autonomous region for Muslim Mindanao, the ARNM, uh, and only four of these uh, provinces adhered to it. The MLF rejected it and returned to war. Uh, and not surprisingly so, because it was not responding at all to uh, what it saw as, his, as its demands. Um, and, and was a, sort of to illustrate here, this was the first, uh, the beginning of this process of the difficulty between what might have been presidential uh, intentions in offering autonomy and what, what uh, the Congress uh, ended up uh, uh, providing as a legislative basis for uh, autonomy uh, in uh, Mindanao. Uh, the, uh, so the outcome basically uh, was that the MNLF was dissatisfied and uh, continued mobilization. The MILF in the meantime had rejected the whole process. So this trajectory is explained in some ways by this initial uncertainty that significantly reduced, uh, was reduced by the initial concessions and compromise. So when we see the period 1986, there was a moment where things could have been very, very different. And certainly the compromises that were made initially seemed enough for the MNLF to be willing to negotiate. Uh, the Constitutional Commission was also a process that was open, democratic, and promised a lot of change from the Marcos era. And the principle of autonomy being constitutionalized certainly was a large gain. What became the problem was that there was a continued deep gap in between the understanding of what autonomy was going to mean for the state and for Congress in particular, and for uh, the uh, uh, MNLF in particular, and MILF as well. So there was a failure to deliver unexpected concessions and Congress diverged uh, uh, from these initial uh, expectations. Uh, if we uh, shift to the uh, period of democratic stability, uh, which is essentially, which I uh, peer, uh, indicate as being post 1992 uh, with the election, uh, the subsequent uh, presidency of Fidel Ramos, uh, you get a, uh, an interesting uh, set of um, new uh, sort of um, mechanisms at work here uh, that I want to highlight. First of all, that uh, democratic uh, stability, of course, at this point, the constitution was in place, was not going to change, and the institutions were uh, basically solidified. Uh, and um, the 1990s, so this allowed in some ways uh, uh, Ramos, uh, in this particular instance, to attempt to reach uh, and start again negotiations. Here's uh, where electoral coalitions come in and are important. Ramos was running on a social reform agenda that included peace as a very significant portion. And he capitalized a lot on this uh, for his electoral base. So we see uh, a lot of um, political capital invested in creating a new, new conditions for peace. 
uh, which came with creating a, a presidential advisory uh, office for negotiating with uh, the Moros, meetings with Misrari and the MNLF. And so there's a beginning of a new sort of set of negotiations that occur. And an agreement is reached in 1996 with the MNLF. And again, and this agreement was actually based on the Tripoli Agreement, on, the third, on autonomy in the 13 provinces as the MNLF had initially uh, expected or requested. Um, the agreement went, I'm not gonna go very long on this because of course it, didn't, it was never implemented, but it, 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 it addressed a number of issues. One was a territorial one, which is going to be based on 13 provinces, uh, but also concessions on uh, revenues from natural resources, uh, concessions on Islamic education, uh, and fiscal allotments that seem uh, that would be uh, given to the region uh, to manage um, manage the, uh, the 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 autonomous region. <clears throat> Much of what happened after 1996 was was a focus on what were the transitional uh, institutions that were put into place, which was the SPCPD, which was an organization essentially channeling aid and development to the region. Uh, and giving representation to the Moros in that transitional uh, authority uh, and gave governance uh, and uh, temporarily to, uh, of the ARMM to uh, Nur Misrari and to the MNLF. So uh, an organization they had rejected, <laughs> an autonomous set of institutions they had rejected, yet they were given the governorship and uh, control over the autonomous region. Um, waiting for basically legislation to put into place this new autonomy that had been agreed in 1996. So this becomes the beginning of a very long process uh, in which uh, essentially uh, this law that was expected out of the 1996 agreement uh, stalled in Congress uh, over and over again. Uh, it was difficult to uh, pass the law, uh, the subsequent autonomy law, uh, and by, the, by 1998, you had a new president, Estrada, that was not supportive. In fact, Estrada, you might recall, um, launched an all-out all -out war uh, against the Moros uh, during his presidency. So although Congress was continuing to push for, for a, a, an autonomy law as a solution, you had the president not really supportive, in fact, uh, attempting to relaunch much more uh, violent, repressive approaches uh, for, with the uh, Philippine Armed Forces. Uh, so uh, Congress was developing the war, the law. It continued developing a, a, a bill that essentially led to uh, an agreement in Congress, uh, Congressional Act RA 9054, which had some opposition, but uh, this was at least a draft bill that, uh, that had a fair amount of, um, of uh, support. Uh, it was denounced by the MNLF, however, for not reflecting the original agreement based on Tripoli. So again, you see, Congress deliberating for a very long time, coming up with a legislation that then uh, the MNLF uh, rejects on the basis that it wasn't uh, corresponding to what they thought had been negotiated with Ramos and with the administration. So uh, to make a long story short, uh, the law did eventually become active uh, because uh, in, of a process in the, in the Philippines, it lapsed into law when uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo became president uh, and, um, this, and, and it became uh, therefore, uh, it, it passed without having been formally passed in Congress in many ways uh, because of the time period. Uh, and it uh, uh, allowed uh, the government to then attempt another referendum to expand the region. Another referendum led to uh, in this case, for uh, a slightly expanded uh, uh, region that then included the Morawi city of Basilan. Um, so the ARMM did uh, then have the legislative support that it needed. However, by then had been uh, not uh, supported very strongly by elements of the MNLF. So the MNLF continued to run it, but other factions of the MNLF left uh, altogether. Uh, so the, and the credibility of the ARMM was undermined by the fact that there was not a whole lot that they had been able to achieve during the time that they were uh, in place. So that leads us to the MILF. And the MILF uh, in many ways uh, had been uh, sitting in the, in the background and learning uh, from what uh, the MNLF was doing and the failures that it saw in terms of the compromises that, that were obtained. 
Uh, they had continued their warfare. They built up uh, an alternative uh, uh, mobilization to the MNLF that became increasingly strong. Uh, and, and therefore, there was an imperative to start negotiating separately with the MILF. Uh, if politically there was a moment when they thought the MNLF could become the representative of all Moros, that was uh, quickly abandoned when the MILF had its uh, uh, alternative uh, alternative mobilization that was pretty significantly opposed to the agreements that were being put into place. Nevertheless, in 1998, you see a general agreement, a framework of intent for negotiation uh, that was derailed very quickly in 2000 by Estrada's uh, all out war uh, against the MILF specifically. Uh, but interesting here, this is the pernicious effect of sometimes democratic, uh, democratic regimes where Estrada in, enjoyed an approval rating that rose 15% uh, during his all-out war uh, because there was strong majority support for crushing uh, the, uh, the MILF's uh, rebellion, at least temporarily. What's encouraging though, in terms of a democratic process, the kinds of checks and balances that come in. Estrada was criticized internally, even in his cabinet. He was criticized by the United States, criticized by the OIC, by Japan. Pressures on the democratic government do in the end uh, have uh, important effects because they affect the reputation that democratic governments like to maintain. And so it was not long that this all out war really lost its political capital and, uh, and including with his vice president, Gloria Macapa Galarroya. As soon as she became president, she reversed the policy. You see here an attempt to begin renegotiating again uh, and, and that was a, uh, a significant continuation here of the negotiations that lead to, uh, in 2006, a breakthrough. Now, um, it was difficult for Arroyo because she had been uh, uh, indebted to the military for some of her support in Mindanao, and the military was against uh, some, many compromises with, uh, with the MILF. And then in 2001, post 9-11, 2002 Bali bombings, uh, the war on terror of course was picking up and uh, she was under pressure to essentially view the MILF as a terrorist group and to uh, attempt to uh, essentially uh, uh, use a more repressive approach in order to, to eliminate what uh, some saw as a terrorism in, uh, in uh, Mindanao. Um, what helped was that there were, of course, significant numbers of people who wanted to continue negotiating. She did have her, um, her negotiation team continue to talk to the MILF. Uh, and there was the intervention of the uh, international monitoring team with Malaysia uh, that was important, an important brokering role here uh, that helped some aspects of the negotiation. But the MILF were coming at this completely differently. I mean, speaking of a nationalist group, to them, they rejected the constitutional process because they thought the constitutional process was biased in terms of the majority. Uh, they, they thought they could not have uh, something pass uh, through the, with the Philippine constitution uh, on the basis that they saw themselves as an equal partner with the state that need to negotiate and not be subjected to uh, having Congress and a referendum basically potentially dilute the compromises that they were trying to have. Um, so they came at this with a, a very uh, high bar, and they obtained a lot in the end in this 2006-2008 breakthrough. The Memorandum of Agreement, which is the basis for today's uh, Bangsamoro uh, 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 Autonomous Region, but the Memorandum of Agreement 2008 uh, recognized uh, not only a new, uh, the Bangsamoro as a nation, but also a delimited territory that, that they finally agreed to. There was this ex slightly expanded uh, region from the ARNM. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the, the formation of a uh, Bangsa Moro juridical entity. That was the problem uh, because they wanted to have an agreement that would set them in a different status uh, and a status that would be sort of a, a more of a state-like uh, entity uh, within the Philippine uh, state. So uh, the outcome of that was that these, this was canceled by the Supreme Court on a basis that was unconstitutional and simply made the Moro uh, think that, uh, uh, the, the MILF anyways, think that again, the constitutional process was the hindrance here. 
It takes until 2012 to have the framework of agreement on Banksa Moro that removes this, uh, this jurid juridical entity and replaces it with an autonomous political uh, entity. Uh, the results uh, take a long time to uh, essentially lead to legislation that was more long lasting. 2012 to basically 2018, uh, what we have occurring during this time period was the end of the Benigno Aquino administration that was worried about constitutional issues. Uh, and so there was difficulty in the tail end of the, uh, of the uh, negotiations. As you have more uh, near elections uh, coming, uh, as in many other uh, periods, uh, the, the will to come to an agreement was basically uh, lowered. Um, and you have, um, you've had uh, 2016, uh, the MILF shooting um, special forces in the uh, Mama Sapano uh, incident, uh, which of course at that point put a halt on any kind of political support for negotiations moving, moving forward. So I think you all know uh, the end point of this being that, uh, you know, in 2018, you do have a Bangsa Moral law that it adopted. And what is surprising is that at the time when you have a president of the Philippines that's becoming slightly more, uh, slightly less democratic, um, you have uh, in, an agreement that is, uh, that is passed. And here, the, the importance of electoral co coalitions are key. Uh, Duterte uh, had Mindanao as his political base. Uh, and uh, his response to the Marawi city uh, mass, uh, uh, kidnapping and, and massacres in 2017, which could have been an all out war as a response. He understands the political capital of going to uh, the, other, the other end, forcing and supporting a, a, an agreement to be reached and the, and the law to be passed and put a lot of political capital in, in that, um, that law being passed. That to me is an important and, and useful um, way of reminding ourselves that where the democratic process oftentimes uh, pays off and, and, and works uh, in favor of, of these kinds of outcomes. Um, so the key points, uh, difficult, the, the Philippines, when you look at it, the outcome in the end uh, was favorable to the Moros. I think we, there's a lot to be said of the post-2018 period. It's been hard with COVID-19. It's been hard to start this new government for, for, and, uh, under a pandemic. However, uh, the elements are uh, you know, the, the MLF, the IMLF has bought into it. The institutions are being put into place. There's a lot more buy-in to this than there was uh, in the ARMM or any other previous versions. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of hope that this will work out. But it was difficult to get there in part because of this problem of having uh, an executive that negotiates on the one hand and uh, a deal in Congress that has the ability to derail and dilute a lot of the points. And this is important to keep in mind when we think about comparatively different democratic systems, how they function uh, in terms of passing agreements that are reached with uh, nationalist groups. Electoral coalitions become key. There was at least two periods here where the social reform agenda of Ramos and Duterte's Mindanao base were key for, uh, uh, for the, uh, the agreement. Um, and the credibility of commitment. There was a strong constitutionalization of autonomy. That was a significant step, even though it was difficult because of repeated failures of the democratic process uh, and limited ability to use the constitutional process, as I explained before. That leads me to the Malay Muslims, the other, the other spectrum in Thailand. Um, but the starting point, very, very similar. Um, I, I have more to say in the book about the Thai state and its origins, and that's part of uh, trying to explain uh, the, the, the problems in Malay Muslim, but I think it's important, it's in, interesting to trace some of these factors uh, comparatively that I was um, indicating at the outset. So the Malay Muslims start the same way, a fairly large um, uh, opposition to the state in the 70s to the 80s. Uh, there were a number of groups that were violently opposing the state, the BRN, the NPP, Pulo in 1970s. Uh, they interestingly disbanded after there was a military campaign called the New Hope and the formation of what was uh, uh, the SB PAC in 1981. Um, and uh, I'll get to that in a moment. So uh, it, in part, it fizzled away because of lack of mobilizational capacity, lack of unity between the groups, but also because uh, there was, uh, in some ways, an interesting period in the 80s of moving towards democracy. Now, it's a little more difficult to have a, you know, a, a date of transition to democracy in Thailand. It's, it happens more 
towards a process over a decade. And these, uh, but the same issues are important and, and, and interesting to look at in that sort of fuzzy period leading to 1988 and, and, and the transitional uh, period from 88 to, to 95. There was uh, this process of state concessions that really did help to diffuse the violence and allow some, uh, some uh, reduction in uh, mobilization locally. The formation of the Southern Border Provincial Administration Center, the SBPAC, was important because it was a new player that uh, was, had the sponsorship of the monarchy and was there to attempt to create some new understanding of the Malay Muslims, opening up to understanding them culturally, understanding their religion, and putting into place some uh, concessions that were actually quite minor, but ended up being significant in the time period. Whether it was a new Muslim you know, Islamic university, uh, some response to uh, language demands, um, and perhaps most significantly in the early period of democratization, the ability of uh, some Malay Muslims to obtain seats in the Deep South and to re have some, some representation in parliament and, some, uh, and linking to uh, the, uh, governments, uh, uh, the, the government coalitions. Although they didn't play a very significant role in the government coalition, they had some representation, which hadn't happened before. So this was seen as a, a initial state concessions and state uh, open, you know, results of the opening of the Thai uh, system, which did give some hope that there could be some ability to improve at least the situation of Malay Muslims. Uh, the, the Wada group, um, uh, that this group of, of, um, of representatives in parliament uh, at the time who gained eventually some cabinet positions, uh, pushed for some concessions and there was some uh, favorable responses in uh, things such as, such as education language uh, to some degree. Um, the SBPAC continued the policy of providing assistance, seeking local conflict resolution, uh, less assimilationist than in the past. And that was a key departure from the past is moving away at least from the the state signaling that before when it had to become Thai and fully Thai uh, in that period, there was at least a recognition that while being Thai, one could still obtain some concessions on language and culture, religion, even though they were fairly minimal in some, to some degree. We see some rise uh, of uh, violence towards the, uh, the end uh, of the period, but some significant concessions uh, that uh, were made uh, making gains, for instance, wearing the hijab uh, and uh, reforming some of the schools to introduce Thai curriculum uh, in the Pondoks, the religious schools, uh, but at the same time, uh, allowing the parallel system uh, to continue as well. And of course, some scholarships to uh, universities. So the trajectory initially is in many ways explained in large part by a lack of uh, mobilizational capacity, that is obviously one of the, uh, the, 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 the reasons why you don't see a huge amount of violence. But the state concessions are not insignificant in disbanding or at least limiting violence for a period of time. Moving away from assimilation repression did give the possibility that some concessions could occur, demands could be made, some negotiation can occur, even though it wasn't, didn't actually happen in terms of large negotiations, there was at least a hope that this could happen. Uh, the electoral interest, um, again, at least temporarily, the fact that uh, included some uh, seats from the Deep South uh, was not insignificant to the, the political calculus that the Democrats had in particular when they were uh, in power. But it lacked credible commitment because any of these small changes could be reversed. The constitution remained silent on the Malay Muslims, remained silent on autonomy. No significant legislation was put into place. So here that crucial element that democracy can play in terms of providing that credible commitment was absent and no signal of a willingness to move beyond small concessions. So you see therefore over time an erosion of that hope and then uh, the rise of violence that occurs uh, uh, later on during the period of democratic stability. So even though you see after 1995, some additional concessions that are made, the Tambon administrative organizations were sort of small um, uh, local um, administration that were in the hands of Malay Muslims. Uh, the Wada continued to maintain some influence. There was a sense that the negotiations had essentially, or the concessions had reached pretty much their maximum. 
When Thaksin comes in uh, to power and Tyrak Tai comes into power, I think there's a strategic mistake made, a very significant one, to signal the opposite, essentially removing the, or reducing the role of the only organization that, had, that was, was respected in the South coming from the state, which was the SB PAC uh, in 2002. And then increasing a repressive approach. Um, it eroded the legitimacy of the WADA representatives and by criminalizing, of course, the uh, groups did not help uh, to, um, to uh, essentially uh, resolve the conflict. Instead, what you see is a rise of, of mobilization. And uh, again, the troops at this point, the Thai, uh, Thai army, uh, at least having in 2004, two significant uh, incidents that uh, that significantly uh, lead to uh, uh, a loss of, of, of uh, compromise and hope among the, the Malay Muslims with the Kruse uh, attack, the, uh, uh, the uh, storming of, a Kruse, of the Kruse Mosque and uh, the mishandling of, um, of insurgents in the Thai back incident, Thakbai incident, which was uh, recently uh, commemorated uh, as a moment in which, of course, uh, to, to the Malay Muslims, a symbol that the state was uh, essentially uh, repressing uh, their demands rather than uh, actually reaching to uh, any kind of state concession. So the only uh, part that is, you know, in this period that I, I recover to some extent in thinking there were some mechanisms at place is that these were highly uh, mediatized events. Uh, it was open, there was open criticism. It led to uh, uh, the formation of a National Reconciliation Commission that uh, looked deeply into the issue of, um, of um, the Malay Muslims, widely uh, consulted, came out very critical of the state uh, and, 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 and had some useful uh, recommendations about uh, the need to increase understanding of local culture and religion and reduce assimilation as tendencies. So, so there were at work some mechanisms that would attenuate the tendency for violence just didn't go far enough uh, in many ways. The end game, of course, uh, after 2004, as far as I'm concerned with the coup 2004, uh, there are very brief moments of democratic return after 2006, too much instability to really have much change in the, in the South during that time. Nevertheless, a small concession was made uh, under the when the re Democrats returned to power. And they reestablish a slightly greater role for the SB PAC and less uh, assimilationist policies. But what we've seen during the period of uh, return to, um, to uh, military rule has been, of course, much, much more of a repressive presence of police and army in the South and uh, basically an end of uh, attempting uh, more concessions. Um, okay, so what are the key points? In terms of uh, for low mobilizational capacity, uh, underground uh, uh, organizations, of course, were the, the way in which uh, they operated most of the time in the, uh, in the democratic period and post-democratic period. Uh, there's been a deep lack of credible commitment of the, con the, the concessions that were made. Um, no ability to negotiate or influence concessions is important. Uh, and the absence of constitutional provisions mean no guarantees that any recognition of language culture uh, that is made can really be um, preserved or even advanced uh, further uh, by Malay Muslims. Electoral coalition, coalitions have been mostly against concessions to Malay Muslims. This is the, the, the part, the pernicious effect I hear of democracy where the majority has been supportive of repressive policies, but there are still mechanisms in, under democratic rule that did attenuate some of that. Um, uh, although I, I'll say <laughs> about as much. Uh, there was very little need to, for deep South seats, but during the time of the WADA uh, representatives, or at least here at work, the beginning is seeing, you know, uh, the need for or, or nurturing those seats were a way of giving small, uh, these recognizing the importance of giving small concessions to nurture them. Okay, wrapping up here, I'm already past my promised uh, uh, time uh, allotment. Democracy in both cases, I think, reduced the ability of the states to sustain repressive policies, with my caveat about the, the, the tax in period to some extent. It made more difficult justification for groups to mobilize violently. So it goes both ways. It's much more difficult for the groups to mobilize violently over the long term. Uh, they tend to at least signal they want to negotiate. 
It opened up opportunities for negotiation or state concessions, uh, but it created, and it created credible environments for representation, even in the case of Thailand, where you did have the, uh, the ability of some uh, representation in, uh, in the Senate, in uh, the, the, the parliament, and even in cabinet. But the different outcomes under democratic periods, some are structural, um, but they're not sufficient to explain this. So there are different strengths and nature of nationalist organizations that explain a lot, but it's not the only, it's, it's, a, it's not the only uh, explanation. Uh, the starting point of nationalist histories and degree of centralization is important as well, but I, I think that there's a lot more that goes on than just simply saying the Thai state has been centralized for a very long time. Uh, Indonesia was also centralized, and yet it was able to decentralize a fair amount. Um, credibility is an important one. The credibility is greater in the Philippines with these constitutional guarantees, but there are some difficulties in uh, the, the high degree of legislative independence uh, that made these uh, cycles of negotiation and failure of legislation in Congress. Um, it, it did uh, succeed, but uh, took a very, very long, a longer time that might have uh, happened on a different kind of uh, political system. No credible commitments in the case of th the Thai state, as I, as, I, as I was mentioning, but strong electoral or political incentives for agreement under Ramos and Duterte did make a fair a significant difference, whereas these electoral uh, interests uh, really were opposite in the case of Estrada and Thaksin, certainly uh, in Thailand as well. More broadly, if we think about the whole gamut of the cases I looked at and how I wrapped this up, uh, I think democratic dividends more broadly are important. Uh, repression, and this is certainly when we look at all periods of repression in Southeast Asia of nationalist groups, repression from violence suppression to assimilation policies have only reduced violence temporarily when it has actually been successful. Uh, oftentimes it hasn't been, even Thailand with the degree of repression, you still get violence. Uh, it fuels rather than elim eliminates grievances. So the idea that authoritarian uh, approaches or violent suppression uh, ends up being a solution. All it can do is it creates a temporary period where uh, there's an appearance of less uh, grievances because violence can be attenuated by repressive means. Um, Democratic governments often make effective concessions with short-term goals. So I think you know, that the, one of the lessons here is that at a moment of opportunity, uh, it's important to, to come early with state concessions and prevent that sort of uncertainty in initial spike of violence that can occur when uncertainty is high. Uncertainty at those times can be volatile and signaling compromise is key in those early uh, periods. Uh, but nationalist conflicts with deep accommodative strategies don't go away. Uh, and, uh, and so even if you know, um, uh, these small concessions are made, one needs to move to the other stage to really try to fill that gap, uh, which is not easy to fill, as I was saying. Uh, democracy does allow, I think, this credibility of commitment made, but it does require that there are solid constitutional guarantees, or at the very least, stable institutions with legislation that is clear and well elaborate that gives groups confidence that the autonomy that they gain cannot be easily reversed. And that's all I have uh, for my presentation. Look forward to discussion and, and questions. Jacques, thank you so much. That was an incredibly rich presentation. I know there was so much there um, to try to get through, um, especially on the four case studies and we could eat others that we didn't even um, cover uh, in, in, in more detail. but. Um, I know that we have invited questions uh, through the chat and through the Q&A, and while we wait for some of those to come in, maybe I could just start with a couple of thoughts and, that struck me. And uh, as I repeat, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a practicing political scientist, um, uh, though I'm trained as one and, and certainly not an expert on secession struggles. A couple of things that, that struck me, and I'd welcome your responses to while we wait for some questions and comments to come through. Um, you briefly mentioned in the Moro case resources being allotted, um, but you know, uh, resource allocation, um, sharing of national resources or provincial resources in secessionist areas um, is often uh, cited as a factor. Um, I think there was a recent agreement about more sharing in Papua uh, from the Indonesian central government. Um, 
um, et cetera. So, so one issue is really is money and then the flow of resources from the state uh, and how that changes under democracy and non-democracy. Uh, the other issue that came, of course, your book is focusing on the role of uh, democracy in these handling. Um, but if you have in your work, what are the non-democratic factors that you found particularly powerful? Um, you know, I mean, after all, each of these have their own history, own structures of resistance to state sovereignty. All are kind of rooted in this post-colonial a nation and state building process. So are there other variables other than democracy that you find uh, quite compelling for determining the trajectory of these uh, secessionist struggles? Now, the final question I have for you is about, um, you know, I started out this presentation in, your, in the intro by saying, you know, we're, we're all grappling sort of with on the policy front sort of about democracy and the decline or deficits um, and this illiberalism that seems to be striking throughout the world. Uh, it's not just, it's hardly in Southeast Asia. We talk about it here in the US, talk about it in Europe, et cetera. Um, what impact is this having? I mean, I, I noticed in India, the, uh, you know, the reduction of rights for Kashmir under a democratic system, right? Um, uh, sort of a tightening, if you will, of the control of Kashmir. So how is that playing out? I mean, you've, you've talked about the way in which democratic democracy has in the five variables you've, you've factored, but, but now you have this other less democratic general context. What is that doing to secessionist struggles? So let me stop there. And I see that uh, comments and questions are now arriving in the chat and Q&A. Maybe we'll get started there and I'll turn then to the, to the uh, chat and Q&A box. Right. Thank you. Um, I could probably spend 20 minutes on each of these kind of I, I, <laughs> questions that you've asked. Maybe just give me a few thoughts yeah. so we can go to the other ones. Right, right. So, I mean, you know, nat natural resource and fiscal resources, those are two key and not necessarily uh, clearly related to each other uh, in some, right. you know, in, 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 the, in a lot of these cases. I mean, yes, resources matter enormously in that there is no credible autonomy without the ability to manage, and, I, and I'm pretty specific here, manage mm -hmm. uh, autonomous fiscal resources, whether they are sharing from natural resources or they are sharing, or, or they're an allotment from the government. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the problem that I've, you know, in, in, in the Indonesian case, this certainly came out pretty significantly, uh, and in the case of Papua in, in particular, not that they weren't generous. I mean, interesting enough, in the 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 uh, special autonomy deal uh, in Papua, mm. really um, surprisingly, did not do much different in terms of fiscal allocations than what it promised to the under the law on the governance in Aceh in, in two thousand six, which mm. is that uh, they both in both cases obtain a a much greater share of revenue from exploitation of natural resources in their respective regions, which was a demand that was made by uh, the Free Aceh movement. Uh, uh, and they wanted a lot more control over oil and gas and they got it in the 2006 version, whereas their 2000, their special autonomy bill beforehand did not have as generous an allocation. The, the, the pop ones got a fair amount of revenue, mining revenue uh, that was allocated in, in the law. They're getting even more now. Um, mm. And, uh, th this sort of special autonomy fund that that was being uh, transferred to them was a significant chunk uh, under a temporary period uh, of money that was being transferred to uh, to the government. And then and then there it gets much more complex. The formula that was put into place also uh, gave, in terms of, of fiscal uh, allotments, a lot uh, greater share than it had occurred uh, in the past or that any other provincial government obtained. So that makes me think, OK, <clears throat> you're right. Resources are important. Um, the problem with the ARMM of it originally is that they ended up you know, getting basically not a whole lot of resources to do much more than pay their civil servants, um, mm. which is an important part of a deal with a, if you don't create jobs for your foreign right. insurgents, uh, that is a problem, but then you need enough to develop, right? Right. 
a lot of the problem has to do in other agreements with the degree of control over those resources. Other agreements were problematic because they would give too much uh, control of the central government, even determining the periods of allotment to uh, the special to the autonomous regions in a way that gave very little ability for local governments to mm -hmm. actually obtain uh, those resources in a, in a significant period of time to, to manage on their own, basically. The Philippines has gotten around that. We'll have to see how the transitional authority works. It's still fiscal allotments from the central government, but they appear to be giving a lot less strings attached to it. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see how that works. Why does it not work in Papua? It's not for the lack of money. There's money that was been, been given to the, to the government, lots of it. It's mm. because there's no investment in those institutions because they were never negotiated. It comes ah. back to the democratic process and the credibility of commitment that I was making, that there's something about how you reach those kinds of agreement that matters in terms of reinvesting the groups into uh, into those institutions. Mm -hmm. Whether non-democratic factors and compelling trajectories, <clears throat> well, um, I'll be honest with you, one of the, one of the non-democratic factors uh, that, that is you know, not, not in some ways good news um, is that it is the, the, the groups that, that have been more organized and organized violently that have obtained more. Now, I don't prone uh, you know, more organization, more violent resistance, but when I talk about mobilizational capacity, right. um, it can be done peacefully. There can be more resistance, more demonstrations um, uh, that, are, that are peaceful. Uh, it is unfortunate that governments see um, uh, only you know when when they have significantly strong uh, mobilizational capacity uh, on the other side that then they're they're making uh, compromises because I think what I see in the Thai case is that they they couldn't unify very strongly so what what the what the result is is that you get these grievances continuing and mm -hmm. then you know it's a it's low low level uh, mobilization and violence but it's not going to go away until there are more compromises so. What, what I have to say about, you know, non-democratic factors is, is, is that, you know, on the, on, the, on, the arm, on the nationalist group side, that seemed to have been a, a rational strategy. On the state side, I, I don't know what the payoff is. Um, I mean, in the end, like I said, the Southeast Asian cases in my, in my uh, in, but it is a problem that, you know, states see these groups as fundamentally, um, a, you know, a challenging their sovereignty. This is why the Indonesians are afraid of Papuans because Papuans really don't want anything else but an independent state. Sure. So it is difficult, right? Um, but but at the same time, I don't see that you know closing down, repressing uh, works, and it just delays uh, a moment in which uh, compromise uh, becomes important. So um, your last question about uh, you know tightening tightening playing out uh, differently now in in this different context. I think it's the same answer as the previous. Yes, it's yeah. happening, but I, don't think, but I don't think that it's going to work uh, because I think what happens is that, but you know, there are ways in which one can give more and respect more rights uh, that will be effective, short of necessarily negotiating everything that the groups want, um, uh, but certainly tightening on, on rights to, uh, tends to backfire. That's at least the cases I've looked at. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. You know, we can talk about it, but I do want to give all our participants a chance, and here they are, and I've got several things coming in on different chat, chat and Q&A on my left and right of the screen. So let me just go through them as I can, please, and uh, do my best to get them to you so you can answer. We have about 28 minutes before, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 18 minutes before a hard stop, so um, I'll just frame that. Okay, so question number one from, um, and these are public, this whole seminar is public, so I am going to read it where you, you can choose to, as one person has done, an anonymous attendee question, but I'll just uh, read them as best I can here. Um, uh, someone thanks you for your very interesting presentation. It's Brahm Brahmancha Basuki, please bear with my pronunciation. Um, research on Papua secessionist. Um, he says, uh, he or she says today armed conflict is becoming more violent. Uh, measured by the conflict who come from revered civilians in Papua, such as health workers, teachers, and Christian priests. The current democratic settings and privileges given to the local government, such as special autonomy, seem ineffective. You talked about 
this being granted, but seem ineffective to extic extinguish the armed rebellion in the mountain regions, as well as Papua and peaceful independent movements in Indonesia and abroad. Here's the question. Do you think the lack of state concessions and commitments is enough to explain the situation in Papua? Uh, Papua, how do you think the Indonesian government's nationalist stances influences the deterioration of security session? Basically, your question about your first variable on concessions, is it sufficient? And if not, uh, what about um, the other uh, variables? Why don't you quickly answer that, and then I'll go through the others that have arrived. Great. I mean, one of the things I said um, uh, towards the tail end of my of my um, of of my talk is that the, the sort of state concessions at the at the early stages of democratization can really uh, prevent a, a spike in violence because they can signal at a crucial time that they, that the state is willing to negotiate and to compromise. Uh, but as as we saw in the case of 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 Thailand, or even if we see in the case of Papua, or we see in uh, uh, even in, in the early uh, days after uh, Cory Aquino's uh, signaling that she was willing to negotiate, that when those concessions don't lead to a, 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 a set of uh, agreements with the, national, uh, with the nationalist groups, uh, then, uh, then it lacks credibility to some extent, right? It lacks this, this notion of credible commitment that democracy can put into place is only if the kinds of commitments that are made by the state end up being uh, uh, well received by uh, the groups. And, and, and there's, there's only one mechanism where this can happen, it's negotiation. Mm -hmm. And negotiation can only credibly happen if you're facing a democratic government because an authoritarian state can only, can, you know, tends to, be able to reverse easily uh, the policies they adopt previously. Now, that being said, it's what I <clears throat> what I was emphasizing that one of the messages of my book is that you might see a diminishing violence over time in the state, it, you know, including Jokowi's government, has a very strong interest in ensuring that violence doesn't get to a point where it it undermines his uh, majority or it starts undermining his relations with other democratic countries, which is on the verge of happening in the case of Papua. It happened significantly for Aceh. And that was the reason why they ended up basically co uh, compromising on a, on a larger scale is that it was affecting its electoral, the electoral uh, coalition. There was a lot of criticism internally, domestically about the uh, management of the Aceh crisis and that fed into a democratic process. There, it's a long and difficult uh, story as to why that doesn't happen in the case of Papua. Um, but to make a long story short, without negotiation, it it's hard to get investment of Papuans into new institutions. And that's what's lacking from the current special autonomy deal and the government that's into place of that was never a result of negotiation. It was a result of the state trying and trying to put into place what it saw as its, its bottom line of what it would, it, it, it would give to Papuans and without trying to then find a compromise. Thanks. We can come back to that. Not Ache, you know, I wanted to ask, but we'll come back to that. But, you know, Ache, because of the 2004 tsunami, some people have speculated that that was a really important driver. Uh, catalyst, uh, catalyst, catalyst, not driver. Uh, so, so, I mean, the moment you look, when you look at the sequence, yeah. Before the tsunami, you already had uh, the high investment of the vice president in discussions. They were close to an agreement. The tsunami I just just made it happen faster. Just, I see, pretty faster. Okay, so that, uh, I'd always heard that, but I wasn't sure. Um, what. Now we have the uh, anonymous question here. Do you think that the Moro secessionist movement has incited in some ways the overall establishment of a Mindanao Republic or even the federalization of the Philippines? I say Mindanao and not only Muslim Mindanao since the region has received a relatively lower share of the national budget, less infrastructure. And I guess this gets to the question of Muslim majority provinces in Mindanao versus, uh, you know, Christian majority uh, provinces. Uh, if you could please uh, address that. Yeah, I mean, if there's a lesson that, if I understood correctly the question, I mean, if this is a sort of a, is this a stepping stone towards mm -hmm. towards something else? 
<clears throat> there's a lot of people who have written about, you know, the fear of giving autonomy to, um, to nationalist groups. This is a lot of in the sort of post-Soviet republics, uh, people have written about this in the fear that this was just a stepping stone towards independence. You know, I, I don't think we have a lot of cases in the world that back that up. Um, in fact, there are a lot of uh, places where they're, they're, you know, I think in the end, nationalist groups, they're not really secessionists, most of them. They end, they end up being high degree of autonomy. They're, they, they're, they're quite satisfied with high degrees of autonomy, provided that they can manage what they see as crucial aspects of their autonomy, uh, of, of governance. And, and um, you know, if there's a lesson to be learned from uh, the MILF here and, and, um, and what has happened in Mindanao, is that despite the fact that they kept for a decade a rhetoric that they were negotiating nation to nation, they wanted to see an independent state or you know, some sort of juridical ent entity that they saw as being you know, almost a sovereign state with a kind of special arrangement to the state, they ended up agreeing to the current situation because in the end, um, you know, nationalist groups are realistic about where their interests lie for their, for their constituents. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea of creating an independent state is not always that, that, that uh, convincing. There's a lot that goes into that extra step of having an independent state and having a high degree of autonomy goes a long way to satisfying all the, the concerns that people have had, or at least a good portion of them, that the rest can get negotiated over time through the normal democratic processes. And I think that has been the consistent agreement in, uh, that the MILF has had to, to basically accept Muslim Mindanao as, uh, as, it, as its region, and then more, um, more uh, degree of, of, um, of rights within that region, rather than having uh, greater um, territorial goals, which I think it's, it's they've abandoned. I mean, abandoned. Yeah. Thank you very much for those. Well, we've moved from Papua uh, to briefly Aceh to uh, the question here in the, uh, Mindanao and uh, Moro. Uh, we're now moving to Thailand. The question here is uh, a colleague of ours, um, um, our assistant professor from ANU. What is the key to successful solution to the Southern Thailand conflict? I'm sure you have a you have one in your pocket. Ready, successful solution to the uh, southern Thailand conflict. That's the question posed to you. Okay. Um, well, I think the key is opening up that notion of the Thai nation and state as being this sort of sealed, uh, centralized entity that one cannot touch. Um, if autonomy were at least uh, allowed as a concept that one can uh, you know, begin to talk about. Because autonomy, it's, it, it has all sorts of connotations. It means a lot of things. Right. The, the nice thing about it is that you, know, you can fill it with as much or as little as you want, which is part of the problem, but sometimes part of the solution. It doesn't mean that it's a slippery slope towards, towards independence. But certainly, you know, to, the Malay Muslims ha have to have a sense that they uh, they are able to advance their their culture, their religion, their their group in terms of uh, their, their certain needs. And autonomous government helps to do that. It's not the only way, but mm -hmm. it's where it helps is that it helps to to solidify a sense of guarantee. Once you have that, uh, it's hard to reverse. Whereas every single you know, little concession that is given on religious grounds or linguistic grounds can much more easily be reversed or, or changed or regulated out. Uh, where, so so I, I think allowing some degree of discussion of autonomy and, and, and would, be, would be useful. Great, thank you very much. Uh, does it matter, the follow-up question, does it matter whether the government negotiator is civilian rather than military if the issue is such a, uh, these um, autonomy? Uh, well, yes, in many ways it does. I mean, the thing is, I think militaries are not good negotiators of political compromise, but they can't be ignored is the problem. Sure. So, um, you know, if I'm gonna get into Myanmar now, <laughs> my instinct. <laughs> But, but uh, you know, essentially, there are contexts in which you just you just can't ignore the military. But, but in you know, even in Indonesia, the negotiators were all civilians. 
uh, and, and the military took a backseat. That did raise a little objections at times, but this is, it was the military in Indonesia that was the most highly institutionalized, uh, the institution in Indonesia for whom the integrity of the borders, the centralized state was essential to what it saw as state uh, survival. And yet um, Indonesia has gone through a interesting process of constitutional change that was gradual and, uh, and these kinds of decentralization plus the special autonomy arrangement with Aceh and Papua that actually make it a really in interesting move away from that centralized notion and has not, it has not um, made uh, the, the state more uh, vulnerable. So in some ways, I think, yes, yeah, civilian politicians need to be uh, those that negotiate it, but you can't, in, in some contexts such as in Myanmar, you know, you're not going to make, in Thailand, you cannot make these kinds of concessions without having the military on board. Yeah. Even if uh, not formally at the table, they play a role in the uh, negotiation uh, spectrum. Okay, so uh, last question, and we just have six minutes here uh, before we have to close out, and that just make some closing comments and, and give you a vote of thanks, kind of. But uh, would you say that in any of the cases, this is from Minna Fredrickson, the military has resisted, obstructed, or violated political agreements that have been negotiated, indicating that weak civilian control over the military is an issue obstructing peacefully negotiated solutions. It kind of follows up on the question on Thailand about what, who, you know, what kind of negotiator. Um, but can you cite any examples where the military is, un if, if I understand the question, has essentially undermined the civilian agreements reached in the democratic process? Oh, in all of these cases that it has happened, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it happened uh, in Indonesia, uh, it, it is happening in, in, in Papua in many ways uh, through various times. Uh, the escalation with GAM uh, after, uh, after the, the, the Indonesian government has had passed a special autonomy bill, it, complete, it immediately undermined the special autonomy bill in Aceh. Uh, so the military has certainly un undermined that. It came close to attempting to derail uh, some of the compromises that were that were being made uh, in Aceh, but it, I think that's where maybe the tsunami uh, helped a little bit, sort of uh, rein in some of the 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 the, the military's uh, perspective. So no, it was a constant negotiation with the military to make the 2006 agreement happen uh, uh, in uh, in Indonesia. But in, in the Philippines, the military always uh, undermined uh, many ways that the, the operations that were, that were launched uh, in Mindanao were undermining some of the, uh, the uh, attempts at, at, at legislation uh, passing in, in Congress. There'd be a new round of criticism and skepticism uh, about, about um, the sort of flare up of violence. Uh, you have the same thing happening, of course, in, uh, uh, in Thailand repeatedly. So. Jacques, it's not fair to ask you in the last four minutes, three minutes, um, about a case that's outside of Southeast Asia and certainly outside of your book, as I understand it. But I, I'm just curious, given your work in this space, um, about the Sri Lanka case. Uh, I mean, it's a I've democracy. been thinking about it. Yeah, it's a democracy in many cases. Um, it did, you alluded to, you know, democracies can also you know, uh, create um, a policy that's much more hard line. So you can, you can have democracy and have a very tough line on secession. Um, and it can work in the sense that it ends the, or certainly deeply undermines the secessionist uh, case. What do, you, what do you make of that? Well, um, you know, I could I could take the way an easy way out, say, well, I, it's outside of my book. But no, I've You're been thinking book. about it, and many for the next book, yeah. Um, but really, I think, you know, I don't think the the Tamils are satisfied with the outcome, right? I mean, it was a it was a democracy that that really didn't give a whole lot of representation to um, to some groups in in Sri Lanka. Um, sure. So yes, one can say, and, and that, so yes, like, I mean, my, my 
uh, or part of what I was saying earlier on, and maybe you know this is um, the long term is can be a very very long period of time, but you know my my argument in in part is that repressive strategies end up backfiring over time. Um, over time, and, and so yes, remove the Tamil Tigers, move you know the the armed group. Have you removed the grievances? Yeah, I don't think so. And so if I were to predict, I would say the problem is not going to go away, right? It's not just- So maybe temporary. we have to think of secessionist struggles, not in terms of making them go away, but in managing them with the minimal possible amount of violence, um, you know, in the maximum kind of integration. If, of and if it was done with afterwards, right, deep right. concessions that are made and and trying to politically find a different path and reforming a democratic uh, context in order to better accommodate the grievances that were put into place, right. that would be a strategy that would prevent a, a resurgence. But it, it doesn't happen very often. Right. Yeah. But Well, what an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, we are very grateful for you to uh, spend your uh, busy Time. I don't know if you're in teaching full mode, in-person teaching mode up there or not in Toronto. We're all no. online. We're on lockdown here until the end right. of the month. That's <laughs> what I figured, as you, you presumably know the situation is a mixed bag here as well, here in the yeah, south of the border. And um, But we're really delighted to meet you for the first time. Thank you for sharing the insights of your recently published book. We look forward to engaging with you again. And thank you for joining the East-West Centers in Washington's Indo-Pacific Seminar Series. Um, and we uh, uh, will look forward to continued engagement with you. So thank you very much. Indeed. Great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you to all the participants and questions. And thank you for the participants too. Great questions, great interaction. Thank you for your comments and questions in the Q&A. And uh, stand by if you're not on our mailing list for events, publications, opportunities for fellowships, exchanges, please uh, seek us out. Uh, Sarah Wong will put the link into our, um, into our uh, virtual uh, format here, and you can um, then receive regularly invitations uh, to uh, events and opportunities and publications. So thank you again. Be safe, everybody, and good day. Bye-bye.